Welcome to the Wide for the Win live stream. Coming to you live from the Wide for the Win Facebook and YouTube channels. Well, hello and welcome hello. to the live stream. Uh, Mark and Susie here. We are here to, to sort of answer any questions you may have. This is uh, nice. and, and of course, I changed the banner, and then and then I didn't save it properly. This is <laughs> ask us anything. He types and it hits save, and then he pops it up on the screen. That's how, <laughs> that's exactly how this works. If you have any questions that you're dying to know the answers to, just go ahead and post them over to Facebook or YouTube. If you haven't yeah. enabled Facebook with the uh, access to show your pretty picture and your name. Just feel free to put your name in brackets so we can at least acknowledge your awesomeness, you and your awesomeness there. Oh. <laughs> Give credit where credit is due. Yeah, exactly. If you're asking yeah. a great question, I'm sure there's other people cheering you on going, please, thank you so much for asking that. I wanted to know. You know what I want to know, Susie? What? You know what I want to know? What? I want to know. So, so you write romance, right? And, and, and all the rest of us who don't write romance get jealous of romance writers because... <laughs> You know, I mean, romance is by far the most oh, popular read, you know, because romance readers are, oh, God bless them. Romance readers are so lovely. They read like six books a day on average. Yeah. <laughs> oh, maybe not that many, but there are a but few. They're the most voracious readers out there <laughs> yes. usually, right? And and yeah. and so wh what do you say to people who, like me, uh, urban fantasy author, uh, mm -hmm. who maybe are not in a genre that's as popular as romance? What are some of the some of the bits of advice you often give when you're doing your one-on-one -on -one consultations. There are still millions of other readers out there who do not read romance. Millions okay. and millions of other readers. Um, they may not read as much as romance readers do. Um, but if you're looking at a couple of the other really big genres like mystery, thriller, suspense, um, another huge category, also have very voracious readers. Um, right. I'll give you here's here's an example one I love because I'm a fantasy reader. I also write fantasy. I just haven't published anything in it yet, okay. and I'm actually working on another one right now um, that will hopefully be the first one I actually publish. So one of the benefits, maybe there aren't as many fantasy readers. Maybe they don't read a book a day or two or three books a day like romance readers do. But fantasy readers are loyal to their authors. Sci-fi readers are loyal to their authors. Um, romance readers, the one downside that I found is they are such voracious readers they don't want to wait for you to put the books out and for a slow author like me that's <clears> not great um you know they're like yeah. when's your next book coming up when's your next book coming up I'm like <laughs> um at this point sometime between never and hell freezing over <laughs> at the rate i'm going um, well i want to get to that but you reminded me of something uh when i worked for kobo we had done a joint partnership, like a, a party. We, had, we took over a restaurant for one night. Marie Force was in town, indie author and trad pub author. And so she was yeah. signing a new deal with Harlequin. So Harlequin had brought her into town. And so we got together with Harlequin and said, we're going to email because we could tell who her readers were mm -hmm. in Kobo, who registered readers who had a postal code that was within the area, like an hour drive of Toronto. And invited them. Uh, I think we had about cool. three or four hundred people come to this, and and it was just sort of. I got to interview Marie on stage. We had drinks and food, and it was sort of co-hosted by uh, Kobo and Harlequin. Harlequin brought uh, one of her backlist titles uh, that she had published a giveaway and signed, and there was some free. Marie had provided allowed us mm -hmm. to give some free ebooks, but her <laughs> and it was on the day of her book launch. So her book had launched that day at midnight, twelve oh one a.m. midnight. And the and it was at six o'clock in the evening. It was on a Saturday, and we were there with her biggest fans from. And we could tell the biggest fans because they read. Because you know, when you are a retailer, oh, yeah. you can tell that they're actually reading the books. And and it was the day her book, new book just came out, and people were like, "Marie, when's your next book coming out?" And and so oh, yeah. what, what, what we did is we we I had a list of the free. Uh, other uh, indie authors who had free romance books that were curated and listed on Kobo. And they were just mm -hmm. so excited um, because they, yeah. yes, they're loyal to their yeah. author, but they yeah. read so much. They just can't keep up. Now yeah. it leads to a question. And that was the question I was going to ask you is you haven't released a new book in a while. And here's the, here's the myth about publishing. The myth about publishing is, well, if you don't release a book a month, you may as well not do it. Right. So that's uh. not 
right? Oh man, that one got, that's the reason why, or one of the big reasons why I haven't published a book in so long is because I bought into that. And I tried to write faster than I could. And I ended up writing five books in one year. Yeah. And they're good books and they're solid books and I love them. But like I pushed myself to the point of burnout and I still wrote, I think, another two or three books after that. And then with that 13th book, I just hit a wall. And I mean, the, the stories fell completely silent. And yeah. the thing is, like, no, you do not have to publish a book a month. I have not put out a book in almost, and, and now it's five years now. Um, and so basically I'm still floating Wait, on those five books. years. Yeah, five years. <laughs> it's brutal. Um, don't do it. You know, I mean, don't think that you have to put out a book a month, but also don't go five years without a release um, because sales are reaching the point. I mean, they're they're tanking pretty quick now because yeah. I can't promote my books now to certain platforms anymore using like um, like my main series. I have just about tapped out even BookBub on it. Right. Um, it's the point where I'm still I still make money on BookBub feature deals, okay. but nothing like it was. But, you know, the series has had like 18 book bub featured deals on it. 10 books, 18. Yeah. So it's almost two per book on average. You know, there is a diminishing return on your investment. You can right. only use a, a particular advertiser so many times before you've pretty much saturated their list, um, which I have most definitely done on quite a few of them with my main series. So don't go that long, but you definitely don't have to publish a book a month. Um, and uh, the reason why, I'll tell you why. Number one way people find books and new authors is still by word of mouth. That is by far and above still the number way, number one way people find books. Right. Still the way I find books. Like if I want to like, I asked, um, I finished reading the nine book Farseer, Farseer Chronicles, um, the Elderling series by Robin Hobb here a few years ago. And I so love this series that I'm like, I want to read more of like that, but she doesn't have any more books out. Well, I mean, she's got two other series in the same world. I've already read those. Right. Um, so I'm like, okay, who, so I went, guess where I went to find more books like that? Where? Where'd you go? Amazon. I didn't go look on Barnes Noble. I didn't go browse anything. I went to my friends who I know read in those categories and those genres and said, okay, here's what I just read. I know you guys have read this. What else have you read by who else? is along the same lines that I'm going to like. Right. You, you still go to people you know and you trust. Um, reader groups, same thing. People you know. Um, word of mouth and book recommendations from live people are still the number one way to find new books. Um, yeah. And I think actually most of my absolute favorite series that I've ever read, like the ones, you know, the ones that earn their spot on the shelves back here, um, these are all my rereaders. So I've read every, other than Game of Thrones, I've only read those ones once. Um, because I'm still waiting, you know, like everybody else for the rest of the books to come out patiently, oh, course, yeah. <laughs> but everything else on the shelf I've read multiple times. Um, yeah. and just about, I think with the exception of maybe once one series on this shelf, I have found, and that was actually, um, Lee Bardugo's, um, shadow and bone series. Okay. And that one, I wanted to read it before the Netflix series came out. Yeah. Um, so yeah. every other one on this shelf back here was recommended by a friend or family member. Or somebody I know I've chatted with about books and I trusted their recommendations. Okay. So, um, and my story about not publishing a book in five years is still very much word of mouth. Um, I don't do a whole lot of advertising anymore on my books because it's throwing good money after bad because I've saturated right. so many of the newsletter services out there that it's like- Yeah, and bringing in new bringing readers in, yeah. is not gonna necessarily, uh, because there's nothing new for them, for your fans. Yeah. To, to, exactly. to, to get to so so we but have I a lot get, of follow-ups related to that a couple of them are i think uh, <laughs> somebody is like it's coming out soon yes it's coming out soon, <laughs> yes, and soon. we're rooting <laughs> for you Susie. and so yeah. th there's sort of some questions and comments related to that and the first one here is from a uh, facebook user that says mm -hmm. a good short can work wonders for keeping your readers engaged until you can get a full book yeah. out to them that, and that is a strategy isn't it yeah. you want to talk a little it bit is about a strategy. That? definitely um and i should have used it more often i just but again, you bought, you buy, I bought into that whole, you have to write a book, like a full book a month or whatever, or have to do it faster than I actually physically or creatively could. So I kind of got away from the short stories. Um, and now I've sort of, I haven't forgotten how to write them. It's just been so long since I've actually written a short story that I'm like, Ooh, that's, that's going to be pulling some writing muscles. I haven't used in a long time. That's going to hurt. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah know? no kidding. Um, 
so but, I guess the, yeah. the next follow up or, or, or related to that is so uh, another person or it could be the same person. We don't know. <laughs> really Sorry. awesome, smart person asked, is yes. a book released a year, uh, uh, a year or every two years workable? And, and I'm going to I'm going to start off with that initially, because mm -hmm. in the traditional publishing world, that is the standard model for most big <laughs> authors like the someone's coming home. I can hear the dog barking. <laughs> so I'm going to probably mute that in a second. It. I'll let you handle this and then I'll come back to it. Okay. okay. All right. I'm going to continue on where Mark started. Um, yeah, that was the traditional publishing model. Um, and I remember growing up, I was a complete and total bookworm and I read so many books and I was used to waiting a year or even two years for my favorite authors to release their next book. So it was in, in the trad sphere, it was definitely doable. Um, it still is in a lot of ways. Genre does matter. However, like if you're a romance writer, if you can release faster, you're going to be better served. If you're a fantasy writer, a book a year or two, you're probably going to be just fine. Um, or or 12 for some authors like George R. R. Martin. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there's a good example. But again, but he, he has a following he, and they'll wait, right? Following. Yeah. But how did he build that following? Whenever one, he's got a trad house pushing his books. But even so, they're good books. They're solidly written people recommended them to their friends who they thought would enjoy the books. Um, yeah. So again, you're tapping into that, that recommendation. Um, and it's, this is one of the hard parts. Um, if you can write fast and you can do it well, that's great. But for most of us, I would say writing fast or writing well, we have to sacrifice one or the other. For me, it's writing fast is what I sacrifice. Yeah. So I'd rather write well. And the reason being is because it's a lot easier to tap into that reader recommendation with a solid book than it is one that's put together in a hurry, you know, that you haven't taken as much time with as you want to. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, five years later, that's why I still have people sending me emails like, Oh, my friend, so-and-so recommended your books and I just devoured the whole series. I'm like, when's the next one coming out? Yeah. About that. <laughs> you know. well, but that, but that's a good indicator because you have a newsletter yeah. and they have a way to reach out to you. So you still have a way to communicate mm -hmm. with them, even if it is an apology. I'm very yeah. Canadian in that way. So, <laughs> oh, but I think... God, yeah, go I'm still that ahead. way. Too. Yeah. Oh, I'm not Canadian and I'm still that way. I'm like, I'm so sorry. It's taken me five years to get a book out. <laughs> but flip side of that is, is I, with my newsletter, I actually keep my readers very engaged with um, stories from... I was uh, My husband and I worked on a rant for three years. That just ended here shortly. But I still have two cows and now a calf. So I've got a herd of three cows. So I'm still sharing stories like that and they connect to my books. Right. So I have a lot of people who will email me if I don't send out a newsletter in a month or two and they're like, right. are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Just trying to write a book. <laughs> well, so that's almost cast? like the short, right? You're yeah. satisfying the readers by yeah. providing them content, content that's related to something they yeah. like about your, the, you know, the, exactly. the, the, uh, the setting, et cetera. And yeah. And now I'm going to have to let a cat out in a second because the cat's trapped inside the room and now wants out. Anyway, they all want to see Liz. They don't want to see me, apparently, the animals. Um, but this is the thing that I think that's really important is, you know, you burned yourself out because you, you pushed yeah. really, really hard, really, really hard. You do have a long-term strategy for that. Unfortunately, you built a great base that's going to help carry you forward. But set an expectation for the reader if that expectation is a book every year or a book every two mm -hmm. years and you're consistent in that you're not going to disappoint the readers but if you do start off with a bang and and i think we had um juliet uh, and banks uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh on a few weeks ago talking uh, about this she set up in advance a bunch of releases but she also set up a pre-schedule mm -hmm. and has managed to to sort of keep it up um, but you know, whereas I, I tend to only release something every, maybe in, in a series every six months to a year, and I've never been that faster than that. Yeah. And so my readers, while they may be disappointed that, you know, it's not quicker and they always like, you know, the readers want it next, they finish the book, you know, the day it comes out or the two days after it comes out and they want the next one. Right. You know, but I've never done that. I've always just said, nah, you know, it's coming out. Like I got the book just came out last week and mm -hmm. uh, the next one's not coming out till next year, uh, February. So it's almost a full year. Uh, and yeah. again, that's because 
well, A, I write other things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and B, I work uh, 20 hours a week <laughs> you know, consulting. Yeah. And so I'm not a full-time writer. <laughs> and and so I, I can't set a pace like that. Yeah. So. And that's, you know, the vast majority of authors are not full-time writers and they can't. And they're looking at these people who are full-time writers who are not only full-time writers and have the time, but who also have that creative engine that they can just churn out book after book in short order. Most of us are not like that. Um, I would, it, the number of, I've talked to probably thousands of authors now and very few of them are legitimately fast, high quality writers. Um, yeah. There's just a certain personality set that is wired to do it that way. The rest of us are not, you know, yeah. and it's like, <laughs> it hurts me every time I hear, and I still hear not as much as, as I did a few years ago when I really burned out. Um, I burned out. I think I was at like the leading edge of mass author burnout. And there are so many authors I've seen that wrote great books that I loved. And they have since quit because they burned out so hard trying to write faster than they could. Um, So it it still hurts me to hear people say, well, I can't write fast enough. Yes, you can. I would rather say, or I would say it's more important to write consistently and release consistently a book a year than it is to write you know, two books, one year, six books the next year, no books for five years, like me, you know, um, it's a lot better to be consistent than it is to be fast. Um, yeah, that makes sense. And like you said, building your reader expectations. If you don't think you can write more than a book every year or every two years, let your readers know that, that you are a, you're you're a slower writer, but because you like to immerse yourself in your books, you know, here's, here's things you can say. I like to immerse myself in the story and I want to give you the best quality book that I can. So it's going to take me some time. And with the exception of certain romance readers who just want to read a lot, um, even my romance readers are like, we don't care how long it takes you because we know the quality of books you write. We love your books. We will wait and make sure that you give us the best book that you can. We'd rather have the best book than the rushed book. Yeah. So um, that's my, actually, my readers have been such huge support. It's incredible. Um, I think authors sometimes don't give readers enough benefit for that. Yeah. And the kind of support they give us just by they're like, oh, well, I have to write books faster for them or they're going to forget about me. I'm like, if you've done your job of writing a good, solid book, your readers aren't going to forget you. They're going to remember yeah. you. They're going to wait for your next book to come out yeah. um, and they're going to continue supporting you, you know, because readers are awesome. They really yeah. are. <laughs> and that was a uh, question was from William Brinkman, who said, thank you for answering that. So I'm going to go back. We've got some great questions coming in. We are going to get to them. Well, at least the ones that we've got so far, because yeah. I'm going to go back to a question that was posted early on. Thanks for your patience, mm-hmm. Troy. But Troy posted this question. I'm getting ready to take my first cozy series out of Kindle Unlimited and go wide. Woo! Three cheers for Troy. <laughs> I'm debating on going full with draft to digital except Amazon. I want to be hands off as is possible. What are the benefits of D2D for letting them handle Kobo, Google? Um, okay, well, the first thing I want to advise you, regardless of how you publish, and I think, Troy, it's up to you to decide this, and, and Susie and I will talk about the pros and cons, is when you're publishing your books wide, please use the original publication date. Don't pretend mm-hmm. that March 2023 is the publication date. Yeah. Uh, there are retailers that get really upset, and the reason they get upset is because it's like deceiving their customers that their customers yes. believe it's a new book. Now, as we know, Robin Hobb example, et cetera, a new book is a book you haven't read yet. So who cares if it originally came out in 2020 or 2019 or whatever, because it was on another platform. It may be new to Apple and Kobo and Barnes and Noble, for example, but just use the original publication date and you will win lots of brownie points with the retailers who will see you as an adamant professional. That's something I just want to stick in there. Now, good advice. In terms of draft to digital versus going direct to some of the other platforms. So the first thing is Google Play, that isn't an option. Google Play, you you can go through some distributors to get to Google Play, but to be quite honest, the way Google makes you do it is you have to go create a Google Play account anyways. So yeah. you're there anyways, just do it. There's no point. And Google Play has some really great promotional tools, including yeah. coupon codes, right? In your series. At the end of book one, you have a coupon code that you generate on Google and you put it at the end of the Google book. And that way, once you got them in the ecosystem, you're good to go there. Um, Their their interface is pretty easy to use too. So it's not- Oh, it's way better. It's it's, it's, it's dramatically improved. Yeah. Yeah. Now I go direct to Kobo. I'm a little biased about Kobo because I work for Kobo. I helped create the Kobo Writing Life platform. So, Mm -hmm. you know, by default, I typically go direct to Kobo. 
Uh, and then I used draft to digital for Apple, Barnes & Noble, Vivlio, Tolino, and all the library systems uh, just to make life easier. There are authors who will choose, well, it's a 10% difference and you don't get access to some of the promotions that you would get if you're direct, right? So it's, it's you know, your, your decision there. So it's a combination that you have to decide, is it worth it for me to go direct to every single platform? And, and so right now I'm running a promo where I had to drive my, drop my price. Well, I pre-scheduled the price on Kobo Writing Life. I pre-scheduled the Kobo, uh, the price on draft to digital I pre-scheduled the price drop on Google Play because those platforms allow me to do it. Amazon doesn't let you pre-schedule prices. Uh, they only let you do some scheduling when you're exclusive, only on those, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the little deal, like the, the free and stuff like that. But when you, for any other price change, you can't pre-schedule them. You have to go and do them live. And so the more the more promos you do, the more times you have to remember to go to every platform and change it. It seems like a small thing, but Dude. if you're running consecutive promos back to back every month and you're doing like, you know, what Susie and Aaron often uh, talk about where you've, you've got like a different promo running every six weeks, right? And you're constantly yeah. rotating through some stuff that can be tedious and that can get frustrating and that extra 10 minutes here and 10 minutes there may not be worth it. So I can't make that decision for you. What do you, what do you say about, about this sort of idea, Susie? Um, judging that he says he wants to be as hands off as possible, I would say, um, yeah, direct is on in Google Play just because you kind of have to be half direct to Google anyhow. Uh, and then the rest of them, I think you'd be great going D to D. Um, that for me, it's it's definitely time versus money. It's like, is it worth the extra ten percent income, or would you rather have the time freed up, the lack of headache, the fewer places to have to manage? Um, and like you said about the pricing. You know, or if you're going to update your backlist, um, even 13 books, if I want to update covers, like if I decide I'm going to revamp my covers um, to try and generate more sales while I take time writing another book, um, that means I have Street Lib, I have Drafted Digital, I have Smashwords, hopefully not very much longer, um, Published Drive, I've got Amazon, Apple, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, Google Play. That's nine places that I oh have. Oh my to God, nine files. places. Wow. Nine places. So that takes time. Um, and if you're and doing that's not even the other platforms, right? Like Radish or, or if, oh. you, if you're doing other things or direct selling, right? <laughs> that That's okay. So this is the number one hardest thing about being wide as an author is the sheer number of places that you have to number one, learn about number two, manage. Um, so if, if you already know that you don't want to have to deal with managing all those other places, then by all means, that extra 10% that you're paying to draft a digital to manage it for you is highly worth it. Totally worth it. 100%. If you're like me and you like that extra 10% and you like to have complete and control because you're a control freak, by all means go direct. Um, there are times though, that even I'm like, I would seriously give up that 10% just to not about the time that I update all my books. And I only have 13 books. I can't imagine it being like someone like Sky who's got 40 plus books out or some people who have like 70 or 80 books out. How the heck do they manage all that? Yeah. Um, and the answer I'm finding is you just don't update as often as you would when you only have a few books out. But still, um, it, so yeah, it comes down to the time versus money. If your time is more important than that extra 10%, yeah. by all means, use a distributor. If not, or try both. Right. Like, yeah, so, for well. example, like, Troy, let's pretend you're going to do first free in series and you're going to want to promote that. Oh, this is not very much not freak, a control freak. <laughs> That's good. Love very it. much not a control freak. There you go. But I'm just going to, uh, here's it. Here's one example. Mm. Um, Kobo has promotional opportunities mm -hmm. when you're direct that you're not going to get yeah. through a distributor. And, and Barnes Noble also has um, them as well. So, mm. let's say you want to really promote the heck out of book one. And you're going to want to take advantage of as many promotions because book one is a perma-free title and you're constantly going to be hitting yeah. promotions. And well, so maybe you publish book one direct <laughs> because as many places as possible. So you can do as much of that promo as possible. And mm -hmm. then the other ones you don't because yeah. you can you can kind of maximize your work flow, right? It, rather than going, okay, so for this one title, yeah, I have to do a lot of extra work because I'm going to apply for all the different promos and stuff like that. Or or just say, well, I'm only going to apply if I can get a promo through D2D &D or whatever. But that that just made me one thing. But there's no one answer mm -hmm. for every book. I mean, I use 
Now, I do typically go direct wherever where I can to at least Amazon and Kobo and Google Play. But the book I just released last week is a payment splitting book. And I'm using them to publish to Amazon and Kobo. Right? The only place I'm not is uh, Google Play because I can't. And, and if it was available, I would. And I would just use that. And that's because... Yeah, I don't, I, you know, there's a loss of 10% margin that, you know, I'm not earning the full 70%, I'm earning 60%, but mm -hmm. Drafted Digital is doing payment splitting for me and that headache alone <laughs> is so magnificent. I oh, never yeah. have to worry about it. The author, my co-author gets paid directly. I get paid yep. directly. I don't have to do that math and I like not having to do mm -hmm. math. Same here. That's, that's, if I ever do a, <laughs> if my little introverted self ever co writes a book with somebody, I am definitely using DDD's payment splitting because yeah. I don't want to handle any of that business. And we actually, um, Aaron and I did a six book box set. And at the time, Drafted Digital didn't have it. So we had to use Publish Drive. Right. Um, and just, I mean, Publish Drive isn't. Well, Publish is, Drive gave not, you a calculator, didn't they? They didn't actually. No, when we did it, they actually handled all the payments. I mean, they oh, handled did all they, the payments. Did they do that? Yes, they do. Oh, um, I didn't know that. I thought they just had a really cool calculator that uh, did the math for you. Or at least not when we did. And this has been, oh, God, when we did this, 2018 or 19. I think it was 19, 2019, okay. something like that. So it's been a few years. Um, but no, they actually handled all of it for us. It's not quite as seamless and as, as user-friendly as Drafted Digital's. Um, so when Drafted Digital announced theirs, I was like, yes! All right! And I had some issues actually getting my payment set up. There was, um, their system threw a weird character in my banking account number. And so I didn't actually get paid for a couple of months and trying to get that worked out with their customer service was a little iffy, but we did get it sol that, right. that solved. And just having that, I'm so glad we went through them instead of trying to do it ourselves because, oh, yeah, no, thank you. We <laughs> should probably see if we could get, we should probably see if we could get someone from Publish Drive to come on and, and chat, right? Just to get, we so that we can get some of those yeah. answers, um, which would be kind of cool. Yeah. And I think, you know, Publish Drive does reach a few places, quite a few places, actually, that draft digital and some of the other ones don't. So I don't think they get quite as much love in our industry as they should. Um, so yeah, I'd love to chat with one of the reps. If anybody's listening, reach out. Yeah, sure. I don't know. We'll, we'll, do a, we'll do a live. I'll probably not interview them because of my, the draft digital mm -hmm. hat that I often wear. They may feel uncomfortable with me, <laughs> but, uh, uh you're ready for uh, Kristen, uh, Kristen writes an all. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So Kristen says when you're just starting out and have launched your book wide on the main retailers, which one or ones would you recommend starting to learn the ins and outs of first? And 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 does that vary by genre? That is a fantastic question, Kristen. It is a fantastic question. All right, so which one would you start with, Mark? Well, I mean, pick one. Uh, so mm -hmm. pick pick one, and 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 so I'm Canadian, so I pick Kobo because Kobo is more popular in Canada and Australia, right? So that would be. Uh, you know, uh, potentially there, there's a lot more action. There's a lot more, mm -hmm. uh, the merchandising is more powerful and stuff like that. Maybe you're an Apple person, right? You just, everything in your house is all Apple, right? Yeah. So maybe you go with Apple books because you already have all the stuff and right. Cause what you're going to want to do, I think the strategy is you go to the bookstore, you look at it, you actually see what, so here's something that's really critical is Kobo and Apple and Barnes and Noble have real humans from the book industry, book nerds, book lovers, yep. merchandisers who manually human curate stuff. That's not to say the systems don't have algorithms, but a lot mm -hmm. of the stuff that gets featured is done by human curation, just like independent bookstore uh, yep. where books get put on the front, you know, in the front window and on display. So I would pick a platform for in, 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 Maybe it's when you already like shopping it. Maybe you're a Barnes and Noble person. Well, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Nook. I'm gonna check it out, right? So, pick one. I'm I'm not gonna by genre. Okay, so um, Eden Books. If you're a romance writer, there's one to start with, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yep. it's all yep. romance, uh, and it's okay. and it's not a major retailer, but it's a major retailer for romance authors, right? Yes, it is. Um, and Robin's done a great, great, great job of getting that up and running. Um, she's actually somebody else. Bring Robin on. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> I'm writing a note right now as we speak. Yes. Um, yeah, no, she's been great. Um, and it is very much, it, it's a romance platform. So if you're a romance author, start there. If you're looking at the bigger retailers, um, 
I like what Mark said. Basically, if, you know, if you're Canadian or British or German, you know, start with Kobo or Google Play because that's going to be more likely what readers in your country are going to be using. Um, I'd hate to say Amazon is the first one just because, number one, there's so much information out there about it. And number two, it is the biggest chunk of the ebook market in the indie market. But you run into the problem of becoming Amazon centric in your thinking if you start there. So yeah. I would actually. You, I'm assuming you started there. I'm assuming you already know everything about Amazon because that's okay. all everyone talks about all the time. Yeah. <laughs> For brand new just... authors who doesn't know, I I just oh I mean theoretically just because it is a bigger chunk I'd say start there. But so many indie authors are so Amazon. I mean even white authors. I catch myself doing. It. I've been at this 11 years now. I catch myself doing it where I'm sitting here thinking about Amazon. Or how things work on Amazon rather than how they work on Apple or Barnes and Noble or Kobo or Google Play. So I'd actually, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of information out there, but I'm almost at this point saying start someplace else so you don't get locked into that mentality um, yeah. and thinking so Amazon centrically. Um, me also, personally, I what? start with Apple because I'm an Apple girl. I've got everything Apple, like you, you said. Love Apple. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I also love Barnes and Noble. I think is actually one of my favorite one because like you said, they're very much um, and their, their promotions are a lot easier to get into than apples. Um, Kobo as well. Um, so those actually, I think even though I'm an Apple girl, I'd start with either Apple or, or I'd start with Barnes and Noble or Kobo because their in-house promos are a lot easier to get into. Um, their user interface is, is, is really user friendly now. Um, but both companies have done a great job of building a very easy to upload yeah. Easy to publish system. Um, and B and M, the categories, right? There's categories yeah. you cannot oh, find that. anywhere else in the industry unless yep. you're direct, right? Yep. And one one thing we always tell authors, especially new authors, is no matter which one you want to start focusing on first, use it as both an author and as a reader. So download the Barnes and Noble app, download the Kobo app, or get a Kobo e-reader. Kobo e-readers are great, yeah. by the way. Um, and yeah, I think Nook's coming out like with my... a new one. <laughs> you like yours? Well, yeah. You know, what? Nook was Nook was before Kobo kind of took over and and produced the mm -hmm. best readers on the market. Kindle's like whatever; they're always catching up to Kobo. And I say that as a wow. proud Canadian. Um, but <laughs> prior to that, Nook by far had the best readers on the market. Mm -hmm. When you when you actually looked at them uh, head to head, Nook was doing some yeah. incredible work. So I'm glad that they're going to be uh, they're going to be doing that again, right? That, because because yep. there are authors who are just blow it out of the water like selling uh, on nook uh, doing and 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 you got to remember it's nook audiobooks too right so if you're if you're wide with your audiobooks you've got kobo you've got google you've got apple and you've got nook there's you know, it's major audiobook platforms uh, yeah. that you can that you can leverage there as well uh, and yeah use those use those apps because you know the apps are integrated uh well audible and and, and the amazon app are not uh, integrated but all the other ones are integrated with their audiobooks too which i like that yes. with my kobo app so i can just listen yeah, <laughs> yeah. listen to those but yeah definitely make sure you're doing as a reader so you can see what a reader would look at you know how easy is or how well does their search function work um what categories do they have if somebody's just browsing like okay i want to read something about fantasy and i want dragons you know, which, how would I go about finding a book on each one of those platforms? It's always important to get the reader side's perspective. Um, it helps in your marketing and how you, you know, what keywords you choose, what, how you write your blurb even. Um, and Erin likes to go on this one a lot. She's really good at the metadata. The metadata, I don't have a lot of patience for. <laughs> um, but, you know, knowing, ask about, ask around which platforms search and index what parts of your books metadata so your title your subtitle your blurb your keywords um barnes and noble it's the title the subtitle and just the blurb right or it's not even the blurb no not even the blurb but i mean kobo yeah. even it's makes your imprint and makes it searchable right yeah so that's yeah, on so. top of your publisher name because you can have a publisher name but an imprint within your publishing company um yeah yeah, there's so many. And that's it's, it's why it's great to really, if you have an opportunity, you know, the the retailers, the some of the distributors, I know Ingram Spark had a podcast and Cobra Writing Life has a podcast. Listen to their podasts. Listen to the yeah. reps when they're they're talking anywhere. Mm -hmm. you, you've done that webinars. Apple webinars, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's really yeah. worthwhile because you can really, you can just pick a little nugget here and a little nugget there, right? Um, that can go yeah. a long way.
Well, you never know which little nugget is going to be the one that helps you really break big. You know, um, exactly. for yeah. me, it was the perma-free first in series and then get a book bub. <laughs> and I was like, whoa. Yeah, April yeah. 2014 blew my little mind. Um, anyhow, that's oh. another that's a story for another day. Okay. Uh, do you want to get to the binge watch question next? That's the, yeah. the next one. On those? Okay. All right. Question from, from Randall Wood. We'll put his name at the end of that. Thanks, Randall. Randall. <laughs> uh, so do you feel uh, the binge watch mindset has set in with readers? Has the bin, binge watch mindset altered their expectations of their writers? Are we expected to write bingey mm -hmm. things <laughs> or, or to allow readers to binge the way that we binge TV shows and stuff like that now? I don't think so. And I think, and the reason why I think that I think readers have always been kind of inclined to binge things. Like if, if they discover a new author, they go out, they read the first book, love the first book, and they go out and buy all the rest of the book. At least that's what I did. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of voracious readers I know did the same thing. They'll binge an author that way. Um, but I think, you know, this is one of the areas where the trad pub model actually helped us out because for a long time, readers have been trained to not expect books as quickly as is the published fast model has trained some readers to expect. I don't, I don't know, but think about it. Even like a new series on Netflix, you're still going to have a year or two gap before you get the next series. Right. So yeah, you can binge that whole series that season, but then you got to yeah. wait for the next season. So I don't know. That's well, but really they're also releasing them. It's, it's kind of funny because yeah. uh, Liz and I have watched some shows as they're being released episode, like a uh, mm -hmm. teen, um, not teen wolf, wolf pack based mm. on a friend of mine one of his books it was turned into oh. paramount and and we had to wait he's like no not till thursday you know he's like no i can't wait till thursday because we're so funny? used to binging i yeah you know what i'm actually starting to really appreciate only getting one episode a week again um because you get like, your life back <laughs> well one you get your life back and two it's like I kind of like to have something to to look forward to, you know, that sense of anticipation yeah. waiting for the next, like, um, I absolutely just devoured, finally sat down and watched the last kingdom, um, about the, the Danish inv invasion of Saxon England. Really well done. If you guys haven't watched that and you like historical, or even if you're, you know, fantasy geeks like me, um, you'll love it. It's great. Very well acted, very well written based on a book series, of course. So of course it's good. It's, it's based on books. Right. Um, yeah. So they've got five series out. We've been kind of, my husband kind of pecked at it a little bit over the years. And I'm one of those people I never get control of the TV. So I didn't, I just be getting really into an episode and he change it. I'm like, what the heck? So we finally, this, um, while he was recovering from a uh, knee injury, finally sat down and we binged the whole five series or five seasons of it. And now I'm sitting here stuck. They have a two hour moving coming out to kind of wrap everything up. And now I'm sitting here going, but I'm actually really enjoying the wait. You know, it's like that anticipation. Like I have something to be excited about rather than just entertainment on demand. If that and makes I, any kind no, of sense. No, and I just, uh, Liz and I have been listening to a lot of audiobooks together while doing puzzles mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of nonfiction. And, and two of the books we listened to recently talked about studies that were done that the endorphin rush and, and the, the, the high that you get just before a vacation when you're anticipating going away is yeah. almost better than the actual the, experience it itself. Help, so yeah. there's something <laughs> in that. So he, this this goes back, Susie. Mm -hmm. Your readers, you're giving them that high because they, the <laughs> anticipation of your next book is coming. <laughs> Five years of anticipation. I don't know about that. But no, I mean, I um, if you have any links to those articles, I'd love to read something about that because that, you know, it does from a psychological perspective, it does make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um but yeah, it's like, okay, so Paramount Plus, any of your like CBS or any of your um, major broadcast networks, they still, even with streaming, they're still only doing like an episode a week. Yeah. And it's just, I don't know, it, it not only gives me time to anticipate and, you know, build up those endorphins you're talking about, but it also gives me time to enjoy other things. Yeah. Like I almost, I'm almost getting to the point where I don't like binging anything anymore because it's like you get it all at once and it's like, oh, well, it's over. And now yeah. I have no life. And I just, I don't know. It kind of leaves me with kind of a like, feeling, you know? But also you're like, we sat down for just one more for five episodes. And the next thing we knew, it was three in the morning. And we got to get up for work yep. <laughs> next yeah. day. So, all right, let's 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 jump over to, uh, uh, let's jump over to this other question. Uh, it's a long one. Let's see what happens when I pop it up. Whoa, almost covers us. 
named <laughs> Epilo. Every year for my birthday, happy birthday, I take another batch of my titles wine. And that's a cool thing, right? There's this annual mm -hmm. process there. I like that. Yeah. So I just took another 15 wine, which puts most of my catalog outside of Kindle Unlimited. Yay, celebration. Woo! I'm learning how to jump on Kobo and D2D &D promotions, but haven't seen any traction yet. Outside of vendor promotions, is there any other suggestions to get traction? Um, so yeah, that, that's a great question. I'll, I'll start mm -hmm. off is outside, yeah. And the challenge is, is uh, you, you apply for as many, you just keep applying for those promos as much as possible. And you never know what's going to hit. But I, I think that the third party newsletters, though, and you know, you're not going to get a book bug featured. I'm going to hide this since you can barely see us. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, yeah, it's not everyone get a book bub like Susie can, but <laughs> um, but you've got written word media, right? You've got bargain booksy and free booksy. You've got crave books. You've got fussy library. Yeah, Susie, you put together a great list in the um, in the. Aaron actually did wisdom, the list, right? Yeah, if you look in the Facebook okay. group, um, yeah, facebook.com slash group slash wide for the win, um, we have a featured or pinned post, featured post, whatever Facebook's calling it this week. Um, and there's a there's a grid of images, and it's a tree. And if you look in the upper right, upper right one, it's called the Tree of Wisdom. And somewhere buried in all those, you know, dozens and dozens of helpful posts, you will find a list um, that Erin put together through a lot of, I mean, she's gathered lists, not only the ones that she's used, but also that other authors have used and recommended. And it is huge. Um, and most of them on the list are fairly small. And you're only going to see, you know, 20... 30, 40, 50, maybe a couple hundred extra downloads on a free book, yep. maybe 10 to 15 more sales, but they're cheap. Yeah. And you can stack a bunch of those together and they add up. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's paid news. That's, that's what we refer to as paid newsletter services or paid newsletter promos. Yeah. Um, and basically what those are is you are paying to have your book advertised in somebody's mailing list. Um, so they have a list of readers that they've curated who are looking for books, um, usually books at discount. Um, so that's, you know, a book bub feature deal would be a paid newsletter promo, e-reader news today, fussy librarian, um, free books, or bargain books. See, that's both written word media. Um, Robin reads, Robin reads only does Amazon and Barnes and Noble though. Um, like the other yeah. ones we've mentioned, they do wide. If you want to promote your books towards the wide audience, the uh, wider retailers and not just Amazon, make sure that the paid newsletter services you're booking send out all the links, not just Amazon. Because there are yeah. some that are only Amazon. Um, there's also Facebook ads, which are, they can be difficult to learn and they can be expensive to learn. Um, BookBub ads, same thing. It's the CPC or cost per click method um, where you're, it's an auction basically so yeah. you're competing against other bidders um they can be i mean there are plenty of authors who have made a ton of money doing it and they've really kind of honed in their skills but it, it's it's one i call more of an advanced marketing strategy yeah because it does take a lot more time and money to learn them and learn them well um I david godwin has a great a great yes. book on book pub ads um i was watching him do a talk at novelist you, you probably yeah. have it on the shelf behind you but, I had it on the shelf and I had a leak in here back before we had, we had to replace where I used to have my little. Oh, I always use David Gogren's books to, to yeah. soak up the water, right? Is that, that's what you <laughs> no, did? <laughs> I like that book. Dang it. Um, I still have a stranger to super fans. It survived the leak. Um, oh, that's a great but no, book I have too, yeah. that one. Um, yeah, definitely check out his book. It's, it's chock full of great information. It'll help you get started on the right foot with book bub ads. Um, I don't know if he's. It's been. It's it's a few years old now. Um, I'm kind of hoping he might put out an update. I'm I'm sure that the strategies and and what he walks yeah. you through has. I mean, there's a few more features available, but um, I'm, yeah. it's pretty it's pretty on point still with with what okay. I remember. Because uh, I haven't tried book bub ads in a while, so I couldn't. I can't. Speak but to every that. time I every time I I do a book bub ad, I I go back to the notes I took uh, from that. <laughs> I'm wondering if <laughs> I have. I think I have a digital and, copy still. And, um, and the books. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, word of mouth. Um, if, if your readers, you know, if you have a newsletter following say, Hey, you know, anytime you have a sale, you can ask your readers, Hey, you know, if you have friends or family who you think would enjoy my books, let them know I've got a sale coming up on, on X book. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hold on a second here. Um, okay. Well, Susie's uh, getting a question, so I'm going to move on to the next question. Hopefully, Facebook user, hopefully we answered your question. Feel free to post some follow-ups. 
Uh, speaking of follow-ups, just to follow up from Kristen while Susie's being distracted by someone, someone coming to the door. Uh, Kristen says that all makes sense. I've been trying some of the retailer apps to read the last few months. So I'll keep at that and think through the rest promos metadata. Thank you. And that's great, Kristen. So glad that you're actually giving, that you're actually experiencing the books on those other platforms, because mm -hmm. that is one of the best ways to get insight. So I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm in the bilingual Canada, French, English, and one of the best ways to learn French is to actually immerse yourself and have no other choice but to live it day to day. And that was the, the only way I ever actually started to learn French properly was when I was immersed in uh, Montreal when I was with uh, a whole bunch of people who did not speak Anglais. So I had no other choice. <laughs> and boy, did that crash course in French really help me out. <laughs> oh, definitely. Like I took four years of German in high school and I cannot remember most of it <laughs> 20 years later, 25 years later. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, so I got to read that again because I missed it here. Um, no, I had a dog trying to get into my office and my husband came out to get him. <laughs> oh, okay. Rest no, you're not See, I got the dog's today. left and you had people trying to break in. So, <laughs> yeah. oh, all right. Apparently, he was uh, standing very longingly oh. outside my door. Um, <laughs> I'm going to pop up this one. Uh, are there benefits to uh, applying an ISBN to an ebook? I'm Canadian, so they don't cost me anything. Thanks for the question, Linda. So I'm Canadian. I hope it's okay if I start with the answer here. Absolutely. You can register with CISS as a Canadian author and get your ISBNs for free. You do not need to have ISBNs for digital products. It is not a requirement. As a matter of fact, you can get free ISBNs or ASINs or dummy ISBNs from Kobo Writing Life or whatever when you published director through a distributor draft to digital provides them for print and ebook not required whatsoever when was the last time the average reader said oh my god i read a really really great book it was isbn 9781727276 like no there's like i read a great book by susie o'connell i read a mm -hmm. great book by whatever they don't even know the publisher um so yeah the benefit of having an ISBN potentially, and it's not really that critical, is just that sense of control and ownership. You know, if, you, if you're like Susie and you want to control everything, you got that. The other thing is, um, <laughs> bless you. I put, because I, I was a bookseller for 20 plus years, right? And I would continually mm -hmm. work in the book industry, but actually managing and, and working at bookstores. And I would always just go and, and, and get the ISBN is the best way to search. And so when I do my copyright page for my self-published books, I list. Hardcover eyes. Here's the hardcover edition, the trade paperback, the audiobook, the ebook. I put them all in there. So if anyone wants to do a search, it's easy. They can just do a quick search in their mm -hmm. library database and whatever ISBNs are a fingerprint for a book. And so if you're using the free ISBNs from the various services, there there may be numerous numbers and that could be confusing. But mm -hmm. really, that's only because I'm anal uh, as, a, as a former bookseller. And, and I really like to know that it's consistent, that my ISBN... You know, for example, my a print book through D2D &D that is, you know, could be sold on Amazon, but I also publish it direct to Amazon. I use the exact same ISBN, so it doesn't matter who prints it. When that Because when the book is printed and out in the world, word of mouth, remember what Susie was saying? Word of mouth, people, uh, you know, people have that. That ISBN is is there, and if people look at it and go, oh, where can I get them? They just go to a retailer and type in the ISBN. Now, obviously, if they have print books, it'll come up, and if not, on the copyright page inside the ebook ISBN is there. So yeah. so does it help libraries then? Um, I I would say it could help libraries. Uh, you'll, you'll often see sometimes uh, publishers will do a library edition ISBN, which I think is a waste. What's the point? Unless there's some something special about the edition. Uh, but I, I, I do like the idea because when I send uh, uh, PDFs to a library that say, hey, I've got a new book out in this series. I provide the ISBN and the little thumbnails for all the rest of the backlist because I know I want to make it as easy as possible for the librarian to go to Overdrive or Hoopla or Baker & Taylor or Bibliotheca or Borrowbox or whatever library system they use and just type it in and see, oh yeah, it is available. I'm going to order it. I want to make it as easy as possible. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll shut up about ISBN. Susie, any thoughts? <laughs> No, I'm kind of on the same page. Um, for me, it's a consistency thing. I do have, or I'm starting to get, I didn't start out with my own ISBNs because I didn't own all my, I'm in the US, so I have to pay for mine. Um, but I'm still applying ISBN numbers to my eBooks as well, just because I want every format that I have to have one consistent identifying number across all platforms. Um, but 
is it absolutely necessary? No. Can you get away without having it? Of course. But like Mark said, and I absolutely agree with this, I want to make it as easy as possible for whoever's looking for my books to find it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, most your average reader is going to look for your author name first or the book title first or the series name first um, rather yeah. than ISBN number. But it's, uh, it, it's worth it for me just to have the consistency. And as like you said, I'm a control freak. So of course I have mine. <laughs> Um, but speaking of consistency, here's something again, Linda, I forget. And I always forget this because Linda, if you're a Canadian and you have any books published, do not forget you have until May of this year, yeah. May 1st of every year to register with public lending rights. And that is available in 36 countries around the world, not the US of A, but if you're in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, you know, a whole bunch of countries around the world, 36 of them, in fact, just not the US. Um, mm -hmm. you can get access. Uh, so in Canada, I just filled out my forms. You have to mail them in. You have to register online and then mail them in. And you, you write down the ISBNs. So do, do you want to have to write down six different ISBNs for one book? Because you, all, you also have to, this is yeah. how funny it is, you actually provide a photocopy of the copyright page and the table of contents and the title page with every book that you submit. So do you want to have to do that four times or once for the same book? So yeah. Oh, and you're going to do it this year. Yay. Congratulations. Woo! Please do it yeah. this year. Please. If, if you are Canadian, it is a phenomenal program. Thank you. Good people at Canada council for the arts. Yeah. No <laughs> kidding. I wish the U S had something like that. Cause it sounds so amazing. I mean, not, not only for authors, but for readers as well. Um, yeah. So that, that whole consistency. And the other thing for me too, is ISBNs on eBooks is it's just one more layer of professionalism. Um, yeah. It's one more thing that, hey, I'm a serious author. You know, I'm just, I'm not some bot out there who's throwing a bunch of AI generated content into a book and hope it sells. You know, I'm an actual author. This is my passion. This is what I want to do. So yeah, you bet your butt I'm going to do as much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add as much professionalism as I can. And that's just, like I say, one more layer of it. Um, yeah. I love so, that. Yay. Yay. So uh, great questions, guys. Great. I just, I don't think I've missed any questions yet. I'm Correct just me. scanning I'm through wrong. and seeing. So I'm scrolling back up, but we've got about eight minutes left. So a uh, great questions. I'm glad you guys asked those questions. It's really important. Yeah. And, and and I don't care if it seems like a, a basic question or something that you believe has probably been talked about before. It is so important that we as authors are willing mm -hmm. to share and talk about and 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 go through questions because a um other people probably don't know and just by asking mm -hmm. it you're helping and b yep. uh, things change over time too right so you know a Thank question you. that you know uh, even six months ago might things might have changed you never know well and, and even yeah. people like me and you have been in this in industry for years you know there's still stuff that we're so used to thinking about and doing that it's no longer a conscious process anymore so it's nice to have that reminder for us like Oh crud! I need to go check my cat or my categories on Barnes and Noble, and make sure I actually have my books in the right ones because I haven't done that in a while. Maybe they've added some more categories. Yeah. You know, so I mean, even even what you think is the most basic question that you think, oh god, everybody's already asked that one. I'm just I can't find the answer. I'm sure it's out there, but I can't find it. Ask it anyhow because you never know. It may be something that nobody's asked or has not asked in that way that makes us think of it in new ways. Um, yeah. It might remind me, it might help me by reminding me of something that I need to do. It might be, you know, 20 other people are thinking the exact same thing. Like, oh God, I don't want to ask that, but they want to know. So yeah, by all means, don't, don't, don't be shy. Ask your questions, whatever they may be. Yeah. And then, and speaking of which, just in time, we got a new question. Awesome. <laughs> all right. So Katie, oh. uh, Katie asks, uh, uh, is there still an affiliate program option for Barnes and Noble or Google play? I've been struggling. Um, I know the Google Play still has one, and it's just not easy because it's not managed by Google. What? It's through with it's the yeah, same third-party company weird. that is it the same one that Apple? I can't remember it, but it was really complicated. I just, that's all I can tell you. And I want to say Barnes and Nobles is kind of hard to get into too, isn't it? I you I, know honestly I, I don't. Know. <laughs> yeah. I gave up on even Amazon's affiliate uh, program because it for me it ended up it became such a hassle trying to manage it that it was yeah. taking time away from actually writing my books. <laughs> yeah. So. That's a Ooh, question. Here's a really I... good one. What's that? 
there's another good question I want to get to before we close out. So don't okay, forget. Yeah. This one. Hey, yeah. Maybe drop that in the, in the group and maybe there's somebody yeah. else out there in the awesome community that can probably answer that for you. Apologies mm-hmm. that we couldn't get to it. So uh, yeah. yeah um, Juliet. Hey, Juliet. Good morning, Juliet. Or yeah, it's late morning for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'd love to know if it's safe to go direct with Barnes Noble. Can we do a poll in the group people outside the U S uh, what I guess. So what do you mean safe? Uh, to go with VNN. We were actually just talking about Barnes and Noble this morning in our board meeting. Um, and I, and this kind of resonates back with that. Um, <laughs> good morning. I slept in. Um, think about it. People who have issues with the platform are a lot more, are more likely to be vocal about it than the people who have no problems. Like I don't ever shout about, Oh, Hey, Barnes and Noble ran perfectly for me today. It just does. Um, I, yeah. but I'm in the U S I don't know. This is a question that would be really great for sky to answer. Um, she's in the UK. Oh, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, but as far as, I mean, there's, there's some hoops that you have to jump through and there are countries that cannot publish to Barnes and Nobles. Um, but I want to say it's, I think Australia, New Zealand, the U S Canada, the UK, I want to say most of Europe is fine to publish there. Um, just make sure that if you do it, that you get all your tax forms approved, filed properly, um, and double check, even triple check with their support team and make sure that everything is the way it should be. Because that is the number one place where we see authors get hung up with Barnes and Noble is with their tax forms. Um, because they do have a pretty small team right now. Um, Right. Between yeah. COVID and then restructuring the company, um, they're they have kind of a not quite a skeleton team, but they're they're a pretty small team right now. Yeah. So you know, be patient, be understanding, be diligent. You know, check back in with them and make sure that everything is set up. Um, once you're set up and you're publishing books, generally things are pretty dang smooth at Barnes Noble. Um, and it's it's one of the ones that we usually recommend people go direct to just because of the promotions that you can get yeah. into. Um, and it is a pretty, pretty big, at least in the U S um, you know, of course it's a U.S. only bookseller, but I mean, they're one of the biggest ones in the U S. Yeah. Um, so mm. it's, it, it is a benefit to go direct. Um, just make sure you all your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted before you go plowing into it, I guess. Um, yeah. And, and I think there's a question about nervous about not getting paid at this point. And, and I want to, I want to first talk about the will the sales dip to start if you've pulled your books down from one one way of publishing and go and publish another way you're probably yeah. going to have a dip in sales initially because mm-hmm. it's a whole new book again yeah. you're starting from scratch unless they did some magic and transferred all your reviews but still the ratings and rankings are probably still a new record so you are yeah. always going to get a, a dip so don't mm-hmm. panic when that happens because think long term yeah. in the long term is this better for me um being nervous so i i honestly yes there's always going to be technical glitches when i worked at kobo there were technical glitches where yeah. you know it was like somebody didn't get paid for this reason but you know it's not that it was not done out of maliciousness or whatever it just didn't happen but barnes and noble has never not paid people yes there's been tech yeah. issues just like everyone has tech issues right whoa the banking didn't work we you know mm-hmm. uh, whatever um fill out those tax forms those are critical yeah. especially i'm canadian and if you are in um, a treaty country to the America, if you're not in a treaty country, there's a 30% withholding unless you can prove you're you know, Canadian citizen or UK citizen or whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's really, really, those tax forms are so important. And you got to fill them out every two years. So uh, don't ignore them because that's 30%. Like the, we, I didn't even have that option when I, because I, I was self-publishing on Smashwords, mm-hmm. American company. And Kindle, the only two options that existed in 2009 or mm-hmm. eight or seven or whenever I first started doing it. And there was no tax form to prove that I was Canadian. I was only getting $7 for every $10 I made, right? I was only, uh, or they were holding withholding 30%. Um, yeah. So it, it, that didn't come along till a few years later that I actually could get rid of the withholding. <laughs> prove <tax>. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, and if there's an issue, we know there's good people that work there. They're not gonna, you know, they're not going to leave you stranded. It may take a while if there is an issue, but they will help you get it resolved. We have confidence. I would say, I have confidence. yeah. And from the authors I've talked to 90% of the problems with getting paid is number one, if you haven't reached the pay threshold, 
Okay, we're gonna show, we're gonna assume you already have. So you have made enough money there. You're gonna get paid. So it's the tax forms. Um, either they need to be updated or they're not filed properly or something's missing on it. And the other one is make sure that your banking information is absolutely correct. Um, yeah. That one I haven't seen that one. It's almost I'd say probably four times out of five. It's it's the tax forms. They're the issue. Yeah. And there's no way their system isn't set up to notify you. So that's something go into your account that you created, check your tax forms. If you have any questions at all, email their support team. Um, it's just support at bn.com. Yeah. Really easy to remember. Um, I think it, there's a lot more fear in the indie community and even in wide for the win about Barnes and Noble not paying because so many people shout about it instead of, you know, asking one of the admins, I mean, we'll tell you who to contact at Barnes and Noble, you know, we'll tell you, okay, no, don't worry about this here. Check this place first, this place. Um, so you hear a lot of shouting and I don't think the problem is anywhere near as prevalent as it sounds. Um, yeah. if that makes sense, yeah. it's kind of like, you know, when a crowd of people, who do you hear the people whispering in the back or the person who's shouting up front, you know? Yeah. Um, exactly. I think you just hear it because people are a little bit louder about it. Um, yeah. And kind of the, you know, once you see one person like, oh, wait a minute, I had a payment problem too. And then that person jumps on board what the first person says and it just, it kind of brings it up. So I will be honest, I've had payment issues twice with Barnes and Noble and both times it was because of my stupid tax form because I wasn't paying attention that it was that rolled around here. It was time to update it again. And you know what? I sent my tax form in. They took care of it pretty dang quickly within a couple of weeks and I got paid both, both that yep. month and the previous month in the next pay period. So, I had a friend with Google Play that had the same issue. Yeah. Tax form mm -hmm. wasn't submitted, and yeah. Google was just hanging on to the money. Rather than you know taking that thirty percent, they just hang on, which yeah. is great. And then when he yeah. put in the just tax information, they paid him, yeah. and everyone was happy. Well, speaking of being happy, we're at the end of the hour. That was that little bell that went off. You probably got to go pick up a kid somewhere. But yep, um, that was my wrap it up. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, up. yeah, uh, Kristen loves the Q&As. Thanks for doing them. We love doing them, too. And thank you guys so yeah. much for your questions. So yep. this is Mark and Thuzi wishing you great wide publishing success. Yes. Happy Wide Wednesday. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Be sure to join the Facebook group over at facebook.com slash groups slash wide for the win or subscribe to us so you don't miss these live videos these wide streams over at youtube.com slash wide for the win